Hi. How are you doing today? I'm really, I've been dreading this video for a long time. In fact, I have debated whether I should or shouldn't make this year, video for years now. Um, and part of me was like, well, I don't really want to scare people off from my channels, but at the same time, um, I don't know, I feel, I feel like I should share my viewpoint and experience with you. Um, whether you agree or disagree, that, that's your choice. Uh, I'm not trying to proselytize here. I'm not trying to, um, I'm not trying to cause problems, okay? I just want to talk about my experience, my observations, um, and talk about, um, the reasons that I made the decisions I made and some of my understanding of the problems of this topic of religion. And uh, I apologize if I offend anybody. I know I'm going to. I, I'm going to probably offend everybody. So, sorry. It is what it is, as we say here in Ohio. Um, so, let's start at the beginning. Uh, when I was a little boy, my parents took us to a series of Protestant churches. Um, and at some point in primary school, we stopped going to church entirely. I don't remember why. I just remember my parents sat my sister and I down and said, we're not going to church anymore. You can continue to go to church. There's a church, and they told us where, where it was, um, which was near our primary school. You can continue to go to school uh, church there if you want to, um, or not. But we're not going anymore. And I really don't know what happened to them that made them stop. I don't know if it was because of the <clears throat> the fact that they were having a rocky relationship with the, which they kept secret from us, or if they had become disenchanted with Christianity or Protestantism or what it was. Also, um, you should probably know my uncle. He was a Free Methodist minister. Uh, he was also an um Apparently, he had a, a little bit of a love affair with uh, alcohol. Um, and, yeah, I'll, I won't go there, though. Um, and my grandfather, his father, and my dad's father, obviously, um, was a Methodist minister um, after he did some other things in his life. He was basically a self-made man, um, as they call him. My sister and her husband became disciples in the Church of Christ, um, for a while, my dad and his wife were very active in their Protestant church, although now my dad is an atheist. My mom, uh, after my parents' divorce, uh, became an agnostic, at which point, you know, I don't, I don't think she told us when she was a teen, when we were teenagers. I think uh, it was when we were adults, but I really don't remember. Um, so, yeah, so... Uh, I did go to one or two retreats when I was a teenager. I did have a faith healing done for me once, and the psychological impact lasted for days in helping me. Because uh, starting in the early teens, uh, I was having a... Well, even before then, actually, when I was in grade school, I was already full of doubts about religion. Um, and oh, that church that our parents said we could go to. My sister and I went once. And then we were like, eh. So, uh, yeah, I was starting to really have doubts about religion. The first religion I knocked off of my list was Catholicism. It was so easy to write it off. I mean, there's just so much hypocrisy and contradictions that I figured it out as a kid. And my neighbors who were Catholics were trying to proselytize me. I was like, uh-uh. No way. Sorry. Um, and I'm not going to go into the reasons why I wrote off Catholicism, but because it all fits into the, into the larger scope of my video anyways. Um, 
So I had a lot of inner conflict going on. I mean, there was the part of me that wanted to believe in God. And there was the other part of me that was like, but... Sadly, that conflict, um, especially because I had religious family members who were, you know, kind of pressuring me a bit, proselytizing me, um, it pushed me into a depression. And then when my parents were divorced and certain other issues were happening in my life, uh, including bullying and, um, well, there was some other stuff that I don't want to talk about um, at this point in my life. Uh, but basically, those things all caused me to spiral into depression. And by my senior year, I was really depressed. And um, uh, that was the year I had my uh, faith healing by the mother of a friend of mine. Um, because they were really worried about me because we it was the, near the end of the school year and I said goodbye to them in this very emotional way and they got the wrong message that I was going to kill myself, which is understandable because they did understand that I was depressed. Um, yeah, so then, um, <laughs> and there's a side story in there that I'm not going to go into about what happened when I told them my goodbye but uh, it was, in, in retrospect, it explains some things that I, I know. Um, anyways, my depression um, started to get better in my late 20s after I was on nortriptyline for several months. Um, I was able to understand how my brain was supposed to be working and that allowed me when I got when I no longer was able to get the nortriptyline from lack due to lack of funds I was, I was able to fight the depression because I knew how my brain was supposed to behave instead of that horrible pit where every day I was thinking about killing myself every day was misery I remember times at one apartment that I lived in, that I would spend a couple of hours sitting in the bathtub with the shower running. Obviously cold after a while. And I was crying. And the landlord was asking why the water bill was going up so much for the building, because it was, you know, it was paid for by the landlord. Uh, I remember times when, you know, friends tried to help me. I remember times when I would get out of the house just so that I could escape for at least a while my depression. But then I would run into my social anxiety. So it was like, well, which way do I go? I stay home, I'm depressed. I go out, I have social anxiety. And also I was pretty poor. I mean, there was, there were some low points. And, um, so that, that, um, Depression kind of led up, and especially, I did have this interesting conversation with a doctor, and that doctor helped me to realize that part of my depression was from the divorce, and part of it was from my struggle with religion. Um, and that was, that was really helpful for me to understand the root causes of my depression. And there are other reasons, of course, but that's not the point of the video. So, after that, in the 20s, I started to search for the truth about religion. So I, I read the whole Bible, I read the Apocrypha, I read the Quran, no, I'm sorry, that was later uh, when I was in Indonesia. I read the Book of Mormon, um, I read about Druidism and Shamanism and Wicca and some other stuff. And then in my 30s and 40s, I read about the, uh, Buddhism and Hinduism via the Upanishads and also in talking to Indian friends. And uh, some other stuff. Um, so I was looking for a religion that actually made sense. Um, you know, because I couldn't swallow the whole, uh, you have to have faith thing. Because honestly, if you can't see it, and you can't hear it, and you can't uh, feel it, and uh, you can't taste it, and you can't smell it, it's probably either provable by science, like quantum physics is now proving some really weird things, or it's absolutely not real. And the only proof that I could find to support any of these religions was made by people who complain, who either claimed to be 
directed by God, inspired by God, and meditated intensely, and, and were enlightened, and, and so on and so forth. And I was like, yeah, no. If it isn't written by God, sorry. Because it can be altered by humans. And it has been. I mean, look at it. Look at how each religion has splintered off into all these different groups because God is not controlling these groups and making sure that they don't split off. God is not protecting its followers. And then there was a the whole BS about gender, which I covered already in a different video, which is much shorter than this one's going to be. Okay, so, you know, as I was reading all these books, it didn't matter which one, every book had pearls of wisdom, it had good knowledge in it that I was able to uh, accept and make use of. Um, so I'm not, there's nothing, it's not like these books have no value to them. It's just that they're books of fantasy, not reality, in my opinion. What you believe is your problem. So, I believed in uh, soulmates and kindred souls. And eventually, I just I realized it was a romanticization of the truth. There are no soulmates. There are no kindred souls. There may not even be souls, at least, in the, you know, and I don't know. Can't prove it. Can't disprove it. I used to also, for many, many years, believe in resurrection because it made a heck of a lot more sense than getting one chance to be saved. I mean, think about it. God brings you into this world with hundreds of different, uh, sorry, actually, there's probably more than, probably more like thousands of different religions if you count all the major and minor religions all the way back to animism. And if you think about it, getting one chance to be saved, I mean, as a Jew, Wow, that's a lot of pressure, and a lot of people will despair, and a lot of people will secretly, well, like, you know what, I already sinned, I might as well just keep on sinning, because I'm going to go to hell anyways. So it made sense to me that God would give you an infinite number of chances to get it right. That God would allow you to move forward in perfecting your soul. It made so much sense to me when you think of the statistical probability that almost everybody on the planet would go to hell given one life and so many choices and so many bad people. Well, there was only one problem with this romantic perspective of mine about um, resurrection. That is that you are unlikely to advance to a state of perfection, no matter how many lives you have, unless you can retain what you learned from the previous lives. Unless there's something to build on each time until you reach the apex of and become perfect, you start at the beginning each and every time with the same obstacles. So it doesn't matter if you get one life or an infinite number of lives. You are unlikely, except for by accident, by happenstance, to advance to a state of perfection. And thus, never will you leave this cycle of torment and misery and excitement and happy and sex and drugs and music, and dance, everything else that we've got. Earth is heaven and hell. That is the real heaven and hell. We live on it. We live in it. We make it what it is. Those who strive for goodness tend to move us in the direction of heaven. Those who get lost or strive for badness tend to push us in the direction of of a hellish existence. And there are places on earth where you would feel like you were in hell. Sad but true. So, like I said, I wrote off Catholicism as a child. This is just so obvious. Um, 
I mean, one, just one little thing in the Bible that really bothered me. And it's not really a little thing. It's a big thing, actually. So we've got the Old Testament and we've got the New Testament. The Old Testament is, about the, is based on the Torah from the Jews. And the New Testament is based on the acts of Jesus and also the things that the disciples did. Okay. So, if you compare the two books, there are lots of contradictions. And yes, I know Jesus said, I'm here to fix things. Oh, so God got it wrong? Or God changed its mind? From that savage, merciless creature of the Old Testament into this loving, less, um, how shall I say it? Intolerant, less intolerant creature of the New Testament. God's supposed to be perfect, but God made a mistake with the Old Testament? Why is the Old Testament in the Bible? It doesn't make sense. And uh, if you even look through the, the Old Testament and compare different parts with each other, there are contradictions. Like, for example, one of the commandments, uh, the, the, the Ten Commandments of Christianity, which are from uh, the many, many commandments of Judaism, the Ten Commandments say, one of them says, Thou shalt not kill. Then another one says, Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife or whatever. Yet, repeatedly, time and time and time and time and time again, God commanded the Jews to commit genocide God commanded the Jews to take women from other societies and religions for their wives. God commanded that the Jews break the laws that God had given. Really? So the laws are only the laws unless God says they're not the laws anymore because this group over here is exempt. From the laws. And therefore you don't have to follow the laws when you're dealing with them. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry. I don't buy that. That doesn't sound very consistent or fair. And then to switch over to this different system in the New Testament sounds to me like it's not even the same God. Because the God of the Old Testament is wrathful and petty and jealous and merciful and loving and oh my god it's like I'm dealing with Jekyll and Hyde in the Old Testament and then it becomes two books that it's it's like even more Jekyll and more Hyde and I just I, 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 ah! it was just too much for me to accept it was too much nonsense so but, you know, let's, let's set the Bible aside, okay? Because this is my journey, right? So I looked at history. Yeah? The Spanish Inquisition. Witch hunts. Crusades. Sexual abuse. Aborted nuns' babies buried under churches. Assassinations. Warmongering. Pope Alexander VI papal bull for the Treaty of Tordesillas, and 35 years later, the Treaty of Zaragoza. And then there was that other crazy guy who said, oh, the world has only been around for 6,000 years because, well, I based it on the Bible, as if there would be uh, an entire history of everything in the world from the beginning to the end with absolutely no gaps. And yet... If you look at the Bible, there are clearly large gaps in the history of the Bible. Large gaps. Large gaps! That would lead a sane person to realize that 6,000 years is not long enough for God's creation. Sorry. Sorry. It's BS. Okay? So the hypocrisy and abuse, the sheltering of pedophiles within the church, the sheltering of pedophiles who have been caught and moving them to other churches where they continued. 
And it doesn't even have to just be Christianity, because I know about this kind of thing happening in other religions too. You get the sick people, the people with problems, and they go into these things because they can abuse the system. And once they get to the top, they can let their friends in and they can all abuse the system and it all becomes completely corrupt. Except the followers don't know until their children are abused or somebody's murdered or whatever. Or seduced. Yes. Oh, speaking of seduction, did you know that in the old days of Catholicism that the priests and so on and so forth, could marry and have kids. And that when they died, their children could inherit their wealth, their properties. That's the real reason that the church finally said, the Catholic Church said, sorry, no more marriages, no more children, no more inheritances because the, the Catholic Church was bleeding off too much wealth. Mm. Ow. That hurts. So, you know, I tried asking questions when I was younger. And I tried in other religions, too. And I always got the same kinds of answers to my questions. It didn't matter which religion I was talking about, who I was talking to. <laughs> Ew, it's free will. You get to choose. Great. I've got a thousand choices with no indicators of which one's the real religion except you're saying yours is. Eh. Oh, it's manifest destiny! You don't have any choice. You have been pre-scheduled for heaven or hell. Oh, great. So it doesn't matter what I do. I'm off the hook. I can do whatever I want to because I'm going to go to heaven or hell and I don't know which. So I'll do whatever I want to do because God has already chosen for me. That's just the dumbest thing I've ever heard. The will of God. Yes. Inshallah. If God wills it, it will happen. And if God doesn't will it, you're screwed. God's unknown wisdom, which we cannot understand. It's just beyond us. Now, granted, if God is omnipotent and omniscient, we definitely can't understand God's wisdom. But to cover up every single problem, every single contradiction, or worse, in a religion with answers like these just shows that God is not in charge, in my opinion. So, things that religious people use to prove, and I'm talking about in general here, not specific to Christianity, okay? Because that was my journey. And my journey stopped when I was in my 40s, I believe it was. I um, was at a training session for neuro-linguistic programming. And... Um, I had this interesting experience uh, where they did, they used one of the techniques that uh, is in certain branches of neuro-linguistic programming teaching and at the end of it, the person, uh, and the person says, sorry, I should uh, back up a step here. The person gave me, said, in one hand, put the biggest problem that you are facing and in the other hand, put something else that's not as great. And then they choose, say to you, choose which one you want to, to deal with. Now, psychologically speaking, most people are going to choose the greater one because that's the one that's really messing them up. And they want to get rid of it badly. Then, the person says, okay, I want you to visualize these things in your hands, right? And then you choose it and you, and you get rid of the, the one thing. And um, now look at that one in your hand there. How does it make you feel? Okay, now give me that feeling. What? No, no, don't worry. I'll give it back to you when we're done. You can, you can have all the feelings back when we're done. I just want you to borrow, let me borrow it for a while. I'll put it in this box over here. So you 
symbolically hand that emotion to the person they put in the box. How do you feel now? And you keep on going through this until you get to a position where you feel calm and relieved. Where all the negative emotions caused by that problem are out of you and in the box. And then the person will ask you, okay, look at that problem. Do you really need to resolve it? Can you live with it? And it was at that point that I realized I could live with it. I didn't have to resolve it. And I, in fact, could not resolve the question of God because only God can do that for me. And God has not chosen to do so. That was a great relief. And that was one of the most important things that happened to me in my life. Sorry, my nose is itching. Ah! And um, now I had a, I had an experience that almost convinced me to become a Buddhist. You see, I was living in Indonesia teaching, and I'm married to an Indonesian woman, who unfortunately has been deceased now since 2017. And whom I prayed to God, please give me her cancer so she can live and I can die because I'm unworthy. Well, that didn't work. She's she still died. Um, so anyways, I had to go to Singapore on a visa run. For those of you who don't understand, in order to work in a foreign country, you have to have an entry permit, which is a visa. And you have to have a work permit and some, maybe some other things as well. In order to get those, you have to exit the country, go to the, an embassy uh, of that country in another country. You can't just process it within. It's very frustrating in Indonesia. You have to leave Indonesia to get the entry permit to come back in, and it's just stupid. Um, but it makes a lot of money and helps support the embassies. So... I went there, and while I was there waiting for my uh, visa to be processed uh, through this agent I used every single time, um, I um, had previous to the, the trip, I had prayed to God to please give me a sign. You know, and this is something I did from time to time. Give me a sign, give me a sign, give me a sign. And I was, I was there, and I was just walking around, and I'm walking past some shops, and there's this rack with the word free. And you know me, if you don't, you know me, I like the word free. So I stopped and I looked and it was religious books about Buddhism. I was like, ooh, how lucky of me. And it was a small rack. So I chose everything that, uh, everything that was on the rack. I took one of them. As I was, and then as I was doing this, somebody stops and talks to me and he says to me, you know, there's a big, store you can go to where you can get lots of stuff about Buddhism. I said, well, where is it? Oh, just go that way. And he pointed off and, one of the, and I was like, oh, thank you so much. I'm, and I, was, I was elated because I really wanted to understand Buddhism and I didn't have much information about Buddhism and I had been kind of admittedly lazy to look it up on the internet, <laughs> which would have been easier than what I did. But anyways, it was a sign from God, wasn't it? Well, hold on. Let me get to the rest of my story. So, I collected those books, and I start walking, and I get to another rack of free stuff that's bigger. Not as big as the guy implied. I was disappointed. I had expected a whole shop full of free stuff. <sighs> but I'm willing to accept free, even if it's not a lot. Gosh! There was so much stuff between what I already had and this larger rack. I put down everything that I had on the floor so I didn't duplicate and started adding stuff to the floor. As I'm sitting there, a woman stops by and she looks angry. And she looks at the books and she looks at the one. There's one that I found about Buddhism and anger, right? She said, may I have that one? And she really looked like she needed it. So I said, yeah, go ahead. I wasn't going to tell her, sorry, I'm taking it home. Or it's back over there on that rack over there. And I was like, yeah, go ahead, take it. You look like you. I didn't say it, but I was thinking, you need it, don't you? 
Um, and then a man came by and he said, hey, there's a store over there that's much bigger and it has lots and lots of free stuff. Free stuff! It's like, hallelujah! Except Buddhists don't say that, but right, you know? <laughs> and so I pack up all this stuff. And by now I've got a lot, okay? I've got a box worth, okay? I'm carrying it around. And I walk and I find in a different, in a mall, a multi-story mall, um, I find a large, well, large, not, not really large, a uh, living room size, for those of you who aren't rich, a living room sized, well, maybe it is bigger than that. All right, a fairly, it's more than, it's bigger than living rooms. It's bigger than living room and dining room put together. Maybe living room, living room dining room, maybe plus kitchen. I don't know, it depends. Um, but it's large enough. And there were lots and lots and lots of books in it. Free! <gasps> so, I walked in there. And I looked at the first book. It was written in Chinese. I looked at the second one. Chinese, third, Chinese, fourth, Chinese. I was like, what the heck? Why did these people send me to the store when it's all in Chinese? Everything was in Chinese. Everybody in there was Chinese. And I was very frustrated. I stepped out of that store. And this man approached me, who clearly was or had been a Buddhist monk because he had those Tibetan dots burned into his scalp. And he said, are you looking for books on Buddhism? Yeah, I was told this was a free store, but it's all in Chinese, and I don't read Chinese. I don't know Chinese. Oh, well, don't worry. Come with me. I'll take you to a, a, the store. And I was a little bit nervous, but, you know, he had the dots, and I thought, okay, I'm in a mall. I'm safe. He's not going to do anything to me. So he took me up a couple of flights, of, uh, and uh, we got it. went into the small store. And the people inside were so nice. They gave me a box for the books I already had. I explained that I was doing research trying to understand Buddhism. And they said, and they and they gave me a bunch of others. They said, read this and this and this. Read this one later. I didn't remember what they said because they I had so many books by that time. I had, not to mention the educational materials that my boss wanted me to buy on my own expense and then be reimbursed for. I also had, you know, I had like a box and a half. And I would say, you know, like, uh, like maybe a medium-sized box, like, like, I don't know, like this box size, I guess. Um, I had two boxes filled with most, mostly the Buddhist books and then a small number of educational books and uh, storybooks, too, for kids. So, wow. And then after we were done, after, and, uh, and I was just so enthused because I had all this stuff. And we're leaving, and the old man, the ex-monk, is still with me, and he says, Are you hungry? I said, Yeah. Um, would you like me to buy you dinner? I said, Oh, okay. So we went downstairs uh, to the uh, food court, and he ordered us some veg uh, vegan food. It's, uh, I think it's vegan. Maybe it's vegetarian. I think it's vegan, though, because Buddhists are not supposed to eat meat, uh, anything from animals, unless they're given it as a donation. Then they can Although I did see Buddhist monks buying meat products, which is strictly forbidden. Um, but anyways, so he orders some laksa for us. And uh, if you've never had laksa, laksa is, I think it's fish-based, and it's got noodles, and it's got some vegetables, and it has an odd taste. And it can be very spicy if you want it that way. I didn't really care for it, but I was hungry, and I didn't want to be rude, so I ate the whole thing. And it, it turned out that it was an interesting thing because uh, some monks sat down and ate with us that he knew. So there were six of us sitting together, talking and eating. Well, I couldn't talk to all of them because some of them didn't speak English. But it was very interesting. And afterwards, he walked me all the way back to my hotel. Very nice guy. Very, very nice guy. And I was so happy. So, you know, I pa on my last day, I packed everything up. I went to the airport and... I was checking out in, and the person weighed my bag and boxes and said, you have too much. You can get a lock. I said, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, you can get a locker and store it for the next time you come, um, or just get rid of it, uh, but or pay for it. And I was like, well, I don't have extra money to pay for it. So I stepped out of line. It wasn't a big line anyways. 
and uh, I started sorting through the box. I'm gonna get this, and I was so confused. I, I tried to remember what the shopkeepers had told me to, were the most important ones to start with, it, and and keep those, and I just couldn't. And suddenly there's this guy, this official looking guy standing over me, and I was like, oh shit. Look at that. <laughs> I look up at him, he said, what are you doing? And I said, well, and I explained. And he said, oh, okay, hold on. And he went away, he came back, he said, don't worry about it. You can go on the plane. I said, well, I, he said, the person said I have to pay. He said, no, no, it's okay. You can take them on. Go ahead. All of them? Yes, all of them. Okay, so let me ask you this. Is this not a sign from God? These series of events? I get to lots of materials. I get to help an angry woman. I meet a nice uh, monk who feeds me dinner and meet some other monks. And then the guy at the airport let's be on the airplane without having to pay for the extra cargo. Is that not a sign from God? Okay. So, you have to understand. Singapore, at least the tourist district, tends to be kind of divided up into different areas. There's little India and little China, and then there's areas where you'll find a lot of Buddhist stuff, and there are areas where you'll find a lot of Hindu stuff, and, and Christian, and, and so on and so forth. I had a um, a hotel right next to some Buddhist shrines, temples, whatever you call them. Right next to it. And on the other side also was the places I had been visiting. So I was in a heavily Buddhist area. So no wonder people were telling me where I could go. No wonder I got help from Buddhist people. It wasn't a sign from God. It was where I had accidentally situated myself. Now, I know some of you are going to say, well, you didn't accidentally situate yourself that you were supposed to be there. And uh, that's for you to believe, okay? That's that's your, that's okay. Okay. Anyways, gosh, that was probably the most exciting experience of my life in trying to get closer to God. And I really do like Buddhism. I don't like what the uh, Buddhists in Myanmar have done with it. They've abused it. I don't like what some of the Shaolin temples did with it in the past, um, but Buddhism in itself has some a lot of things about it that are really, really good compared to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. It's better. I'm sorry. Better. Sorry. Not sorry. Okay, so let's see. Um, so there are lots of ways that... Religious people will try and have tried, present and past, okay, I'm going to be historical as well, uh, to convince somebody that they are the real thing, their religion is the real thing. Now, if you go to, the, to many countries, especially in Asia, even here in the United States where people are very, very gullible sometimes, you can find spiritual healing, um, you can find spiritual surgery where they fake insert their hand into your abdomen and pull out chicken guts that they had hidden in their hand. Because they go like this. And they close up their fist and they had the chicken guts hidden here and then they squeeze so that some blood comes out of the chicken guts and then they pull them out and then they do something so they can grab some more without you realizing they're grabbing more. They're very good at this. And people go to these surgeries all the time and pay them lots and lots of money and then they die quite often. And my, my father-in-law went to faith healer after faith healer because he had diabetes and hypertension and he had a stroke and they wanted they were so desperate and every time my mother-in-law ex-mother-in-law ex father in law she would um, give the faith healer money as if a miracle had occurred when nothing had occurred except for chicanery so these people will use magic like mystics and shamans and witch doctors and psychics and mediums. Or they're very charismatic. Um, and they will manipulate you with psychology. They'll trick you with mixing facts and fiction. And do all kinds of stuff. And then, well, yeah, the holy books, what I was talking about with the Bible, it's not unique to the Bible. It's, it's in a lot of different religious books. You find these contradictions and things that just don't make sense. Um, so, 
then there are symbols and rituals and consumables. So symbols, for example, the Christian cross, the Jewish uh, David star, the, the moon for Islam, rituals, baptism, confession, induction, uh, consumables, drugs like ayahuasca and peyote, holy water, holy wafers, sacrifices, and so on and so forth. And these are all things to, to catch your interest and make it more mystical and, um, and make you desire more of the religion. On top of that, we have the, the non-physical aspects, the psychology and the sociology tricks that are played on you. Okay, so um, if we look in a broad context of all religions, we see that between religions there are a large number of general similarities. It's in the details when the devil messes things up. But if you look, and, and there are famous people like Joseph Carpenter for one, uh, sorry, Joseph Campbell for one, and um, others uh, who have studied religions intensively and notice, oh, this is the same in most of the uh, in most or all these religions. This is the same. This is the same. This is the same. This is the same. And these are the little details that are different. But the general rules and conditions of most religions are the same. Well, why would that be? Well, because one, they're working off of each other. They're working off of a desired way of life. Um, they uh, have built themselves on a different religions platform of morals um, and so on and so forth. There are lots of different reasons it, and it can be also because of manipulation, control, getting your money, getting your well, uh, you know, your, your property, getting your commitment uh, and so on and so forth. It doesn't matter whether it's a regular religion or a cult, they, they all do this kind of stuff to one degree or another. So then there are the religions that are built on top of other religions. Now, um, you can do research on this for yourself, but if you look at uh, the Judeo-Christian Islamic system, okay, so Judaism came first, Christianity came third, Islam came, I'm sorry, Christianity came, came second, and Islam came third. Now, some people have argued that Islam came second, but that's impossible because Jesus, or Isa, is a prophet of Islam. Therefore, Islam had to come after the other two. Okay? But then you look, take a look at Christianity. Within Christianity, first there were many, many different splinter churches. Then they were consolidated by Const Constantine uh, into Catholicism. And then later there was all the break-offs from them that became Orthodoxy and Protestantism. And then there's the Mormonism and there's the televangelism, which is often fraudulent uh, behavior to get your money and make them rich. Uh, and uh, that will, the, uh, what is it, uh, the, the wealth... Christianity, where they say, you know, give and you will get, and they, but you have to give to me, and then you will get more back. Uh, that sort of nonsense. It's basically a Ponzi scheme, um, and they should be arrested. And then, if you look at Judaism, well, Judaism, I, I, I know that there are different aspects of it, and maybe even different sects, but I can't speak anything about it. Uh, but in Islam, there's Shia, there's Sunni. There's Sufi, and there are certain other minor ones. Um, and then if we look over at uh, India, India, which is the birthplace of numerous religions, including Jain and Hinduism and, and Buddhism. Um, well, let's see. The, in, in ancient times, in prehistory, to the point that we don't know if it was a different religion or the roots of Hinduism, there were the Vedas, which were the, the, are the oldest scriptures and stuff from Hinduism, or that are used by Hinduism now. <coughs> And that developed into Hinduism, as far as we know, uh, as far as I know, anyways. And that turned into Theravada Buddhism. From the from the uh, Thera Hinduism came different kinds. There's the caste system. There's the one god system with different. All the demi all the different gods are just a representation. Just like when you talk about uh, God and his different uh, personality traits, you know that those are you know they're the ninety nine traits or whatever. Um, it, Hinduism, I think, has different sects, but it often has to do with focusing on one particular god in the pantheon. But in reality, Hinduism is a monotheistic religion, 
that has been corrupted into a uh, pantheonic religion. Um, from Theravada Buddhism, there sprang Mahayana, Nichiren, Tiantai, Pure Land, Zen, and a bunch of others. Um, so, religions keep on building on each other, and uh, even when you talk about the savior figures in religion, this, you can see the same exact thing. So, and I'm not an expert on this, um, Bill Mayer, Maher, um, I don't always agree with Bill Maher, uh, sometimes he's, he's, he's an idiot and sometimes he's a genius, um, but uh, he made a, a, a movie called Religious, which addresses the issue of savior figures. He talks about Krishna, and he talks about Jesus, and he talks about all these other figures who, it really seems like one was built on top of the other until we get to Jesus and other current holy figures. Um, so I urge you to do your own research on that, how various fig uh, people, demigods and gods, seem, you know, and even if you look in Europe, and you look at the old pantheonic religions, the mythology that we studied in, high, in uh, what, junior high school, I guess it was, um, you'll see, oh, gosh, um, there's uh, the Greek one, and there's the Roman one, and then there's these other ones, and they're all very, very similar to each other, except for, like, names, and sometimes there are differences in which god or goddess handles what. Um, but, you know, like, there's Ares and Mars for the god of war, and there's Aphrodite, and uh, I forgot her other name in the Greek and Roman ones, and there's uh, Zeus and Odin and uh, Fudge, I forgot. Anyways... Oh, and also, most religions have a revelation, an Armageddon, an end of all days. And a lot of religions talk about flooding. Does that... And a lot of... And, and pretty much every religion I've ever looked at claims miracles have occurred. Modern day and historical miracles. It isn't something unique to Jews or Christians or, or Buddhists or whatever. People from all different religions are claiming, oh, it's a miracle, it's a miracle, a miracle. Well, if all these religions are having miracles, it's either a bunch of BS and people with psychological problems, or God loves all the religions. You choose. Okay, so... I looked at mythology, and, that, and when I thought back on mythology in my later years, I realized, wow, that was a clear sign that religion is bunk. Okay, so, sorry, sorry, sorry. I said the word you don't like, and I said other words you don't like. I'm sorry, please don't hate me. Please just love me. Please forgive me. But don't proselytize me, because I hate that. My family used to proselytize me so much. It really got on my nerves. And finally I just said to him, I said, look, I love you. You're, you believe what you want to believe, but don't proselytize me anymore. I don't have an interest in what you believe. Some of them got the message faster than others. And some of them still try. I love them. And they're not abusive. And some of them have even apologized. But um, I hate it. I hate the proselytization. It's an abuse of, of my beliefs and an infringement on my sanity. So knock it off. Miracles. Yeah. So how do they pe get people in and keep them in? Well, obviously, the easiest way is start when you're a baby. And they, you know, right from the very, very start, before you even have any ability to analyze, you get indoctrinated. So they teach you superstitions, they teach you about mythical creatures like Santa and the Yeti and uh, uh, Jack Frost and the Easter Bunny and all this other stuff that it tends to be based on characters from old mythologies, old religions. And they superimpose their holidays over pre-existing holidays from the pagan religions, pagan being non-Christian in this case, but also others. Um, and then, you know, eventually you get old enough and you're like, well, there is no Easter Bunny, is there, Daddy? There is no Santa, is there, Mom? There is no Jack Frost, is there? You, oh, oh, you lied to me, but that's okay, because I love you. You lied to me. 
So, and then there are the ghost stories. And good golly, are there ever. There are so many monsters around the world. Oh, I, I decided to do a, a kind of a, a, a joke story where all the mythical creatures of the world get together. And the more I researched, the more I was like, oh my God, i got to limit myself. So I got some from Europe. I got some from Asia. I got some from Oceania. I got some from Africa. I got from South America. I got from North America. I put them all together. But that was a lot. There are so many. Man, it's crazy. So they teach you all these superstitions and fears and magic is real stuff. Then when you get old enough to realize, at least some of them, some of you anyways, that this stuff isn't real. But you hold on to your religion. And what's the difference? Well, these are all fantasy creatures that scare you or are fun to, to believe in. Um, or, and, or they happen at times when you get gifts. So you like them, but you're not really emotionally committed to them. You're not psychologically committed to them, but you are emotionally and psychologically committed to God. And just to make this very perfectly clear, God and religion are two separate things. Now you can argue this, but let's make it very clear again. If you believe in a religion, who made your religion? God. God made your religion. Is God a religion? No. Okay, there you have it. God and religion are two different things. Okay, now that we've got that settled. So, once you get past the stage of believing in nonsense like ghosts and, and mystics and, and uh, superstitions and stuff like that, and I know a lot of you are still doing it and you're still watching all this nonsense on TV and saying, Oh my God, it's real! Because I see the YouTubers faking you out all the time, saying they've got ghosts and they've got somebody helping them to stage things and they use camera tricks so you don't notice that person way over there in the corner dressed in clothes that almost matches the background. Okay. So, in later life, you may be brainwashed through intense experiences with acceptance, love, and kindness from the congregation and the clergy. You may get a lot of help. You may be in a very bad situation in your life. And miraculously, these people who you've been in your life all this time appear and, and they save you. And look, if that works for you, if the people who saved you are your haven, are your sanctuary, are your saviors, and that religion helps to keep you safe from doing harm, from, from harming yourself, from being a homeless person, whatever. If that religion helps you, I'll, all power to you. Go for it. Do it. Because at least you're better off than you were. But watch out for the manipulators because they are there. The ones who will take advantage of you to get things because they use religion to do that. The pedophiles, the narcissists, the psychopaths, and so on. They use religion to defraud you, to take your power and for their own. Be careful. Because they are people. They're not religion. They're not God. They're people. I don't care if they're clergy. They're still people. People can do good or bad or even both. All you have to do is look at history to see what I mean. So let's see, what else do they do? Um, well, in essence, they use psychology and sociology to manipulate you. Now, um, keep in mind what the other stuff I said, like magic. Magic is a big component of religion because there are aspects of magic that can be used to trick you. Let's see, so things that they use in terms of psychology and sociology is, well, you know, there's that, that sense of belonging, right? When you belong, you want to continue to belong, even to when you're being somewhat abused. <clears throat> it takes a certain level of abuse before you want to leave. And some people even then don't want to believe because those are the people who are willing to do whatever it takes not to be abused, including abusing you as well. So, there's a, you have a desire for purpose 
for greater meaning, for non-chaos, for community, for common moral grounds, for support, for giving up power to something greater, wanting to be led by the nose because you don't want to be the leader anymore. You're tired. You just want everybody to tell you what to do. Being lonely, being addicted, who knows what else. Maybe you're in crime and you want desperately to get out and it's a way out. Hey, who am I to say you're wrong? But this is what they do. And also to get you in and keep you in, they use peer pressure, the threat of excommunication, the threat of ostracization, and, and ostracization, obviously, threats in general, abuse, name-calling, murder, exile, afterlife incentives, fantastical stories. Oh, I'll tell you about one of my favorite ones in just a minute. Stories of the future that cannot be proven, stories of the past that cannot be proven, claims of divine intervention, power, uh, sorry, claims a divine right to collect wealth and power, telling the, you that you're wrong, shotgun weddings, retreats, and in conclusion, the fantastical story I want to say, share with you today is from Islam. You may have heard that some suicide bombers of Islam become that way because they are approached by somebody who's manipulating them through the religion, you know, through religion and psychology and all that, and they're manipulating them, and they're saying, "Look, I know you've done some bad things, but God will forgive you if you put this bomb on your back and you go to this location and explode it. You will die. However, when you're dead, you will appear in heaven, and you will have a whole everything you want. You will have a beautiful place to live. You will have lots and lots of money, and you'll have all sorts of virgins to fuck." Oh, excuse me, to have sex with. Now, these people that they choose are often not necessarily well-educated, or they're very selfish people, or they're very greedy people. These are people who are prime targets for that kind of opportunity. They can redeem themselves in God's eyes of all of their crimes, <clears throat> and then end up with a great place, lots of swag, and lots of booty. And so they happily put on that backpack, or carry that bag, and detonate it in a crowd of Jews, or a crowd of Christians, or even a crowd of Muslims, or Buddhists, or Hindus, or whatever. Anybody that they decided to target. All because somebody decided to believe in a story that doesn't even exist in the Quran and isn't actually part of Islam. Except for the manipulators who use it. And it actually is a very old story. Because they used to use this kind of story in the old days to get people to do public assassinations in which they would undoubtedly be caught or killed after assassinating somebody. Because the assassin was a throwaway, expendable. Their job of a public assassination was to terrorize the people in that group to say, hey, we can get you anywhere, anytime, even in public, and we don't care if we die. And it works. People get, well, most people are intimidated and they back off. Most people are killed, imprisoned, disappeared forever, which probably means killed, or run away, or give up. In the name of God, I bless you. Again, what you believe is your choice, and if it helps you to become a better person, if you cease to hurt others, if you cease to hurt yourself, if you make your life a better life without sacrificing others, I'm all for it. If that's what helps get you through the day, that's fine. But if you're using religion and you're hurting people, you're robbing people, you're doing bad things, you really, really need to stop. Okay? I don't know what happened in your life. I don't want to judge you because maybe hellish things happened to you and that turned you into who you are today. But there's always a choice to change. With or without God, you can. I have. 
and I know a lot of other people can too, and you don't have to give up the love thing, you don't have to give up the supportiveness. You can form a group that's a non-religious group. Now me, I'm not actually an atheist, I'm a deist. <clears throat> but it's basically deists don't believe in religion. We just believe in God. Which is a lot less complicated in some ways. So, I hope this was uh, educational, or at least interesting. Or at least thought-provoking, if not that. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you have a great day.